and I talked to both Israeli negotiators and Palestinian negotiators, and eventually uh, I came to the understanding that th the way it was organized in, in Washington couldn't possibly succeed. And then I had lunch uh, with a young gentleman who was uh, the, the primary advisor of uh, Shimon Peres, who was then the leader of the opposition, uh, besides m Mr. Rabin, uh, in, uh, in Israel. And uh, he had reached exactly the same conclusions as I did, that the way it was organized in, in Washington couldn't possibly yield any results. So we then, uh, in that first uh, lunch in, uh, in Tel Aviv, decided to establish a secret back channel. So the first meeting in this back channel took place in, at the American Colony Hotel between Faisal Husseini, who was the local Palestinian leader in Jerusalem, uh, and Yossi Beilin, who then had become um, Deputy Foreign Minister, Shimon Peres was, was Foreign Minister. So we, um, that is um, my wife uh, Mona and Jan Eglan, the Norwegian uh, State Secretary, we conducted several rounds of negotiations um, between these two, uh, two gentlemen. I realized that it would be impossible to reach any agreement uh, without uh, the, the PLO and Yasser Arafat, because they had the power to block everything. Uh, and this was one of the major flaws with the Washington talks. In uh, 1992, in December, uh, I flew to um, uh, Tunisia uh, and met with Abu Allah, who again led me very early in the morning, three or four o'clock in the morning, I believe, uh, to uh, Yasser Arafat and my first meeting with him. Um, which lasted for hours. Uh, and then um, uh, uh, he suggested uh, that we should set up a secret back channel. You mentioned that you, you had become convinced, and, and you weren't the only one convinced, that the Washington negotiations could never be successful. Uh, and you also meant, touched on the reason there that uh, if the PLO weren't participating... Well, there are several other reasons. But could you just expand on why those reasons... Yeah, and, um, we, in, in a way, we decided to do exactly the opposite of what they did in Washington. Because in Washington you had colossal delegations they lived at um, different hotels, they, they never had meals together. They were brought uh, together with U.S. proposals coming uh, to, the, uh, to the desk and then they went to their press conferences. And one of the first things I discovered when I spoke uh, in, uh, in, in Gaza and Jerusalem and Tel Aviv uh, with the uh, Palestinian and, uh, and the Israeli negotiators was that they were telling me things which was exactly the opposite of what they were saying on television. So what we decided was that we had to go through a round of pre-negotiations which only had two purposes. One was to create trust. The other one was to have a discussion on what kind of an agreement uh, w which could be possible to reach before you actually started uh, negotiating about the substance of an agreement. And so, so, uh, so we uh, put down some ground rules. One was that there should never be more than five uh, representatives on each side, uh, but that the ideal would be three. And that they could not change negotiators during, uh, during, uh, during the talks, and that it should be totally secret. And, uh, and, and this was uh, one of many reasons why the Institute FAFO uh, was chosen as the facilitator and organizer uh, of the talks, because uh, if it leaked, it w there was deniability because you could say it was an academic exercise. That's why they didn't want the foreign ministry to organize the talks. The foreign ministry uh, w was, uh, was informed orally uh, um, about what was uh, uh, going on and my wife and um, Mr. Eglan uh, was uh, um, uh, also present at uh, many of the, uh, uh, of the negotiating uh, rounds. Uh, and, and we also took a, fun, a fundamentally different role than the Americans because we were not brokers. We were go-betweens, facilitators and organizers. So we actually refused to be in the negotiating room. But uh, didn't the Norwegian role change? Uh, in, in May 1993, the, the new foreign minister, uh, Holst, I think his name is, um, I mean, he then moved the negotiations from the Norwegian's role being a facilitator to actually being a mediator. Is that not true? Let me first uh, qualify a little bit the facilitator and go-between role, because it was the facilitator and go-between. Uh, and the go-between role is substantively important, because particularly when the parties were not in session here in, uh, in Oslo, 
uh, they could not call each other directly. So the telephone calls by and large went through me, actually in my office here at this institute. And then they would say, how do we interpret this? Are they serious about this? What did it actually mean? So I could then interpret it and twist and turn uh, things the way I wanted. Uh, because our job, uh, the Norwegians, was actually each time to convince them to come back to the negotiating table. And then we had to interpret that there actually was possibilities, uh, that, there were, um, uh, uh, that progress had, been, uh, had been, been done, and that there would be more concessions if they came back. So in a way, the, the role as a go-between is to, to glue them together through this, through this difficult um, uh, period. This was maybe um, the starkest illustration is that um, uh, in July that year, uh, the uh, Israelis asked us to, uh, to fly to um, uh, Tunisia um, w uh, with a draft agreement uh, and present it to Arafat because they were not sure, because they thought it was so sensational that the PLO was doing what they did, so they thought maybe Abu Allah did it on his own and that his boss, Arafat, was not in the picture. So, um, so we flew then and uh, Foreign Minister Holst uh, my wife and myself, we had a, uh, a meeting with Arafat alone where we went through the, um, uh, the, uh, the agreement. We were rather puzzled, by the way, because Arafat started talking about kissing points. And um, uh, we absolutely did not understand what he meant with kissing points. So, um, um, so uh, Holt suggested that maybe he meant checkpoints. No, he said kissing points. Um, and what he meant was a metaphor for that there has to be some connection between Gaza and the West Bank, which is, he called a kissing point between Gaza and the West Bank. So we then understood that he was into every detail of, uh, uh, of the agreement and actually was the guy who was behind it. So he was following the Oslo negotiations very, very closely? Uh, very, very Sorry. closely. Do you think the same was happening on the Israeli side? Do you think Yitzhak Rabin was following the negotiations? Wasn't uh, I, he more sceptical of the Oslo? Yeah, uh, yeah, actually, um, Arafat was very interested in that very question because he was also puzzled that the Israelis were doing what they were doing. So we then, at the request of my wife and I, at the request of uh, Arafat and the Israelis, we flew directly from Tunisia via Rome uh, to, for the first time, meet Foreign Minister Paris, and we were brought to an hotel adjacent to uh, uh, to the airport, uh, uh, to a suite where Paris and his um, uh, key advisors uh, were sitting, and they basically interrogated us for several hours about everything we had done um, uh, in every single detail. And Foreign Minister Holster also written a letter referring to our conversation with Arafat. And then Paris uh, uh, said he had to go to the Prime Minister, Yitzhak Rabin, and report on all the details we had told him, and that we could meet him for breakfast the morning after to um, get the decision if it was going to continue or not. So the Israelis were actually checking if Arafat actually was behind it in order to move on. And then Arafat was interested if Rabin actually was behind it, or if it was just Paris who was doing this on his own. So then we had breakfast with uh, Paris, the, my wife and myself, uh, the day after, and he informed us that he had a, a green light to um, conclude uh, the negotiations from the Prime Minister, uh, which we communicated, which we communicated to, uh, to, uh, to Arafat. And then... Um, what month was this? Uh, uh, this was in July. Uh, and then uh, <coughs> we had... Um, um, a round of negotiations actually in Paris and then uh, Paris um, in uh, August. Uh, I remember my wife and I, we uh, came from a wedding uh, in my hometown uh, Bergen. We were in a car on our way to the airport and then a voice called on my cell phone and it was Paris. It was the first time he called me directly uh, and said, um, uh, you have to take your boss and fly to Stockholm um, uh, tonight. Uh, so I said, why should we go to Stockholm? He said, I want to finish tonight. Uh, so, uh, so he said, I don't want to speak about this on the phone, you just have to come. And of course it's very difficult for a Norwegian foreign minister to fly secretly to, to, uh, to Stockholm, uh, our beloved neighbour. Uh, so I was then sent by the foreign minister together with um, a guy from um, the Norwegian secret police. After the official dinner, which uh, Paris participated in, 12 o'clock midnight or so, he came to the hotel. 
And I remember I told him, but Shimon, uh, there are no Palestinians here. And, and he said, we will do it on the telephone. So I was then um, asked to, uh, to get hold of Abuela on the telephone, which I didn't manage. I talked to his wife, I talked to his office, uh, he was nowhere to be found. So then uh, I had a number of Arafat's office, so I called that number and Arafat himself took the phone. And he was in Tunis? He was in Tunis at the time, so, um, and we used code on the, t on the uh, telephone. Uh, so um, uh, Paris' uh, code name was uh, the, the grandfather, and Arafat was the Palestinian grandfather, and then it was uh, uh, the son, uh, and you know, that kind of. So I said, I have, uh, I, I have the grandfather with me. He wants to finish tonight on the phone. So Arafat said, call, call me back in 10 minutes. And uh, I called him back in 10 minutes and said, I have the whole leadership of the PLO around my table, including Abu Ala. We can start negotiating. So then um, uh, Paris didn't want to speak on the phone, so he then took positions on the drafts we, uh, we had and asked uh, Holst to, um, uh, to convey it. And of course here we had a much more substantive role because we were then with both parties and we could come up with our own proposals on, uh, on things. So these negotiations lasted uh, uh, the whole night. And the Swedish government must have had a, a horrible telephone uh, bill after we left. But anyhow, um, so early in the morning hours, uh, there was an agreement. And it was told later that uh, several people around the table in, in Tunis started crying after uh, the agreement was reached. But of course, uh, and then Paris came to uh, Oslo. And then it was the last round of negotiations here in Oslo at the Plaza Hotel. The secret police uh, took um, the Palestinian uh, um, uh, delegation from the hotel uh, in a closed van, through the kitchen by the way, uh, and brought them secretly to, uh, to the guest house. And then we put um, the delegations in two different rooms. Um, and then um, there, was a, there was a formal, um, uh, formal greetings. Uh, I was the master of ceremony. Uh, and then uh, they signed the Declaration of Principles at the very same table, by the way, as uh, the signatures on the agreement between Sweden and Norway, Norway when Norway seceded uh, from Sweden in 1905. We carried the table uh, uh, of symbolic reasons uh, to that room. And then there were speeches and uh, then it was over. And then um, uh, there were a few uh, hiccups left. Uh, one was that we had not informed the Americans. And of course, uh, America is uh, Norway's closest um, ally. Um, and of course, uh, it's also the closest ally of Israel. Uh, so um, Mr. Holst and his wife, uh, Marianne, uh, uh, Mona, uh, my wife and myself, uh, uh, Mr. Paris and two of his associates, Avi Gill and Joel Zinger, uh, we flew in a private plane to a military base uh, uh, in Point Magoo in um, in California, where Warren Christopher, the Secretary of State, uh, was having his holiday in the vicinity. Uh, um, and <coughs> I remember we were brought to the Admiral's uh, office at that military base, and um, uh, it was um, only two, two people from the US side in the room. It was uh, Warren Christopher and Dennis Ross, who I'm his chief negotiator, who I met for the first time there. Um, and uh, we had then written the statements on board the plane uh, which were and the kind of divisional work which should be done. Holt should present the background, then Paris should give the overall view and then Joel Zinger, his legal advisor, should uh, go through the agreement uh, for Christopher. And Christopher, uh, uh, he greeted us very cordially um, and he was making very careful notes on absolutely everything but he didn't say anything. So, uh, so I remember when we uh, his, He's very, he was a very, he passed away, um, God bless his soul, um, uh, but he, uh, he just had a very stiff uh, uh, facial expression, uh, it, which made me rather nervous that this was not at all to his liking. So I remember I walked out of the room and I turned to Paris and I said, Shimon, how do you read him? So he said in his very, with his very dry humor, he said, um, uh, <coughs> uh, he smiled twice and said one, one sentence, he's very enthusiastic. And that actually turned out to be true. Uh, so, um, uh, so we had a bilateral meeting, the Norwegians, uh, with him, and then the Israelis said, and then uh, he actually, the, the only sentence he said at the very end of the meeting, he turned to Dennis Ross and he said, um, 
Dennis, what do you think? And Dennis Rose said, I think it's great. Uh, and then there was an agreement that there should be a signing ceremony in Washington at the White House lawn with President Clinton. <coughs> but it was one big problem left that uh, the PLO had not recognized the State of Israel and the State of, of Israel had not recognized the, PL the PLO as the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. So we were then tasked, the Norwegians, of, uh, of negotiating that agreement, which was done a few days afterwards in Paris at uh, Hotel Bristol. Uh, very dramatic. Um, uh, and then um, there was an agreement uh, and letters were set up. So we flew directly from Paris to, uh, to Arafat. <coughs> um, uh, who signed the letter recognizing the state, the state of Israel? We took the letter and flew to um, to, to to Tel Aviv, and then was brought to Jerusalem, where there was a signing ceremony at the um, Prime Minister's office. Uh, all of it highly televised, uh, and uh, and which we uh, brought back to Arafat again, which paved the way for the uh, signing ceremony at the White House on the 13th of September that year.